I guess this is the second tea club that I'm giving, and the first tea club was like three and a half years back when I just joined and it was Lisa Berlin. So today I'll be talking about RNNs, long term dependencies, and uh, like long term. So there are two parts of this talk. Like, so in the first part, like I'll focus more on the long term dependency, and in the second part, I'll focus more on the like long term aspects. So the first part is about uh, uh, like our new uh, AAA paper, which is the non-saturating reference units for modeling long-term dependencies. And this is a joint work with Srina, Yuji, Samir, and Yash. So, like, if we think about uh, how the, how like if we think about the progress in feed-forward neural networks, like people moved away from saturating activation functions to non-saturating activation functions long back. And in the case of recurrent neural networks, it is still the case that Saturating activation functions dominate, uh, especially because of LSTM, which is very, very successful. Right? Like, so, but this work uh, aims to introduce a non saturating recurrent unit, uh, which we claim is better than LSTMs in terms of modeling long term dependence. So, that's that's the aim of this work. And so, just to get started, like, so I'm sure everyone knows recurrent neural networks, uh, but still, like, they are the most successful class of architectures for solving sequential tasks. and so, so here is a vanilla RNN which basically takes xt as input and computes the pre-activation which is w times xt minus 1 plus u times xt where w is the recurrent rate and u is the input rate. Right? And usually you have some nonlinearity on the top of this pre-activation uh, which is either sigmoid or tan h. So this is a, a very vanilla RNN and we all know that like this vanilla RNN has problem of vanishing and exploring rate. So, so why is that the case? Like simply because let's just throw away all the other terms in the equation and just consider uh, this one term, which is h is equal to w times h t minus. Right? Like so, now I can expand this recurrence and write it as h t is equal to w power t times h zero. Right? Like so, now if w admits an eigen decomposition of uh, this form, right? So q lambda q transpose. Right? Like so, so then this term becomes something like this. So you have ht, which is basically q transpose lambda power t qh0, right? So now you have the, so if the eigenvalues are less than one, then you're multiplying them by t times, so the gradients are going to vanish. On the other hand, if the eigenvalues are greater than one, then the gradients will explode. So this is one of the classical problems in training recurrent neural networks, uh, simply because like, you have to choose your recurrent matrix, uh, like basically you have to initialize or parameterize your recurrent matrix in a in such a way that the eigenvalues lie very close to one, right? Like more than one, it's gradients are going to explode, and if it's less than one, gradients are going to vanish. So, so that's the problem of vanishing and exploding gradients in, in an RNN. So now let's just look at vanishing gradient uh, in depth, right? Like, so, so again, like the same vanilla RNN. Uh, if you want to compute dou L, like the differentiation of the loss with respect to some hidden state HT, right? Like, so then I can write that as dou L by dou H last, last hidden state, then dou last hidden state by that particular hidden state. So I can further expand this term, and it becomes something like this. So it's basically a chain rule of uh, let's access if dou h k plus one by dou h k, right? Like so. So now let's look at what this differentiation is. So if you differentiate this term, so like when you differentiate a hidden state, like you're going to get f dash, and when you differentiate z k, you're going to get w. So essentially you are multiplying w for t minus one times, and you have these additional f dash things, like so which you are multiplying with, right? Like so, now if you look at this derivation, there are basically two sources of vanishing gradient. So the first source of vanishing gradient, which is commonly observed uh, by people, is like this repeated multiplication of w matrix. So when you multiply this matrix repeatedly, like we have this issue of vanishing or exploding gradient that I described in a couple of slides back, right? Like, and the other issue, uh, which is less noticed is this saturating activation function that we are using in R. So, so in general, like there are these two sources of vanishing gradient problem, and most of these architectures that like you see on the top of R, like any R N plus architecture, uh, attempts to solve this issue, but not the second issue. So, so why is it important to solve this vanishing gradient problem in R? Like it's it's mainly because like we, when we want to learn long term dependence, when I say long term dependencies. Let's say like you have some application where you have a dependency from thousand times up to thousand times. So in practice, LSTMs can easily learn dependencies from hundred to two hundred times, but like after that, it's going to struggle. So 
<laughs> that is mainly because of the fact that like when you have vanishing gradients, like you have very very little feedback to the beginning of uh, the sequence, and it is going to take a lot and lot of time to catch up these dependencies. So some examples of long-term dependencies being like long-term credit assignment and reinforcement. For example, an action that you took a week back might have an effect today. Okay. So, so how can you give that credit assignment? Uh, like if you if you have the LSTM which is not going to consider anything more than 10 seconds back, right? Like so, so this is a, this is one standard application like where long-term dependency really matters. So the second application would be lifelong learning, like so where like you have a system which is learning throughout its lifetime, right? Like so task after task after task. Now when you're in such a meta setting, like where you have to remember what you the knowledge that you gain like a bunch of tasks back, like 10 tasks before in the current task, right? Like, so such requirements are like really long-term dependencies. And that is uh, like that is another application. Okay. So now the next immediate question is like so we have seen that vanilla RNN has this issue of vanishing gradient, right? Like so is LSTM a solution? So so we see that LSTM is like the de facto uh, recurrent architecture that people use in any new uh, sequential tasks, right? So the first thing that you try is an LSTM, but is LSTM a solution for long term dependent? So let's look at the equation of the LSTM. So, so you can so so you can see that in the case of LSTM, the added cell updates are additive in, 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 in like instead of multiplicative, right? Like so so like instead of having a multiplicative reference, you have an additive recurrence, which means that you don't have the first issue, which is basically the repeated multiplication of the right? But LSTM is adding more saturating functions in the form of gates. So this is going to create problems when it comes to long-term dependency. So, so in practice, what happens is LSTMs are better than RNNs in terms of modeling long-term dependency, but they still only learn short-term dependency. So LSTMs are RNNs. Oh, so vanilla RNNs. Okay, so LSTMs are better than the vanilla RNN that I described. Uh, but in practice, like they really learn uh, short-term dependencies, and hence the name long short-term memory, right? Like, so, 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 so LSTM is not a solution. So, so why is that the okay? case? Like, so again, to reiterate what I said, so like LSTMs has this idea of gates, like to prevent information from leaking or like to store lock the information for longer time stretch, right? Like, so, so, so essentially, the gates need to saturate to pass information to very long distance. But the saturation of gates has a side effect. So when, when the gates saturate, the variant updates to the gates themselves shrink. Right? So, so basically, like, so this is more like a diagram of between whether to saturate or not. Like, so you, you want the gates to saturate so that the information lasts longer. Uh, on the other hand, like if the gate saturates, then the learning becomes harder because like, you get very less variant updates. Right? Like, so, so this is a, a standard issue, uh, which is less observed in LSTMs simply because of the kind of tasks that we are currently interested in, right? Like, so for most of the like, standard NLP tasks and uh, and simple reinforcement learning tasks that we are considering, like so, we don't have dependencies more than 100 or 200 times. In that case, like we don't like LSTMs are good in that case, so we don't really uh, see the effect of saturating. Um, okay, so but by what like, I'm going to do for the next 10 15 minutes is to introduce uh, a, a new architecture which we are calling as non-saturating recurrent units. Uh, which will attempt to solve both these issues in, in, in any recurrent neural network. Okay, so this is the update equation for a non saturated recurrent unit. So, so the idea is very simple. Like so, so here this part, this looks like a vanilla RNN. So now I have this additional memory that I'm conditioning on. Right? So the WC times MT minus 1, where M is basically a flat memory vector, which is similar to the cell state that you have in LSD. So it's similar to cell state, but except for the fact that we allow this memory to be of much larger size than the hidden state vector, uh, so that it can hold more information. So if your hidden state is of size 100, like the memory could be of size 500. Okay, so, so that's the, that's that's one minor difference. But other than that, like it's very similar to the cell state. Okay. So now the next question is like, how do we update this memory? Right. Like, so so we update the memory using uh, an update rule, which looks something like this. So 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 what we are essentially doing is so we have these alphas and betas, which are basically scalar values representing what to write and what to remove. So this is like the, the scalar content that I'm writing. And this is the scalar content that I'm removing from these, uh, the, the memory vector. And these are basically functions of xt, ht, and the previous number. So yeah, alpha and f beta here are basically linear functions followed by an optional relu non-linearity. 
So we don't have a sigmoid or tangent shear. And similarly, these VIs are normalized vectors representing where to write and when to write. So again, they are functions similar to this, uh, except for the fact that you have an explicit normalization uh, after you compute these functions. So yeah. You take a summation over K1, but then you have some things where you, the index is I. So is it is, is K1 supposed to be I or K? Oh, so I, okay, so this is maybe a wrong notation. I is equal to 1 to K1, right? So, okay, so I is equal to 1 to K1, similarly I is equal to 1 to K2. And like how many values does K1 take? Uh, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm coming to that. So, 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 so essentially like one way of looking at this is to take your current hidden state and come up with a low dimensional prediction of this hidden state, let's call it to be K1 dimensions, okay? So if you have 100 dimensional hidden state, you come up with a 10 dimensional projection of this hidden state, where K1 is 10, right? Like so now you're going to write every dimension of this low dimensional projection in different basis directions. So, so those directions are designed by, defined by these VAs. So like every VA tells you which direction to write the first unit of this low dimensional position, the second unit of this low dimensional position, and so on. So similarly, you you have beta, which is basically a K2 dimensional vector, right? Like so, so which decides what to erase or what to remove, and you are doing that like unit by unit. So, so that's like a, an intuitive way of like understanding like what the Abbott equation is trying to do. Okay. So now, how is this solving the two problems that we have discussed before? Right? Like so. So the first thing that you can observe is like, so the, the memory updates are additive, they're not multiplicative, which means that the first issue with RNNs is uh, like taken care of, right? Like, so remember that like even in additives, additive updates, like gradients are still going to vanish, but like at much lesser that rate than like the multiplication updates. Okay, so the second thing is like, we have relu gates for both the adding operation and the, the like removing operation, like so, which means that uh, we don't have any saturating gates. Like the only kind of gates that we have are non saturating gates, right? Like so, so, essentially, like so, this update equation uh, should solve both the vanishing gradient due to repeated matrix multiplication and vanishing gradient due to saturating gates. Yes, yeah. so why do you have like two summation? I, I just don't understand, like, why do you oh, have yeah. two summation? Okay. Okay. Like just one. Yes, yes. So, so this is bit redundant. So I'll come to that. So, so this is bit redundant in the sense if I don't have a real nonlinearity, then any head can learn to add or remove, right? Like so, so there's no um, like there's no notion of adding okay. or removing. But if I have real nonlinearity for all these four terms, then this is essentially strict addition, strict. So the remote. answer is because alphas and betas can be. Yes. Yes, so, so so we have both that options, like so this is just a general description of that. Yeah? Uh, so one of the reasons we had sigma vanish was to limit the output of the memory cell any other cell to zero to one. And here we are not doing any of those clipping. Yes, that is true. So we don't do such clipping and we do face some like exploding gradient right. issues. Uh, I will I'll come to that uh, like my calculation. Uh, okay, so but but to give you a very short answer, like so, like I think that it's better to be in the exponent gradient regime and like try to control it than being in the vanishing gradient regime, simply because like when gradients vanish, there is no hope of learning these effects. But when gradients explode, if you can control it properly, then like you have some hope for learning these effects. So not not exactly talking about gradients here, but I'm saying the value. Yeah, yeah, of yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I get that. I get that. I'll, I'll come to that. Okay, so okay, so one issue that uh, we have uh, to make this a more practical ar architecture is the fact that we are directly conditioning on this huge empty vector, right? Like, so as I said before, uh, instead of empty being 100, like it could be 500 when the hidden state is 100, right? Like, so, so essentially, depending on the task, you can increase the value of this empty, right? Like, so, so when you have such a high dimensional vector, uh, then you're conditioning based on that. This WC is going to have lots and lots of parameters, which means that this architecture can quickly overfit uh, if your task is very simple, right? Like so, so like one trick that we do to avoid this um, uh, is uh, yeah. this idea of uh, this idea of outer product trick. Uh, so, so, so what do we do here? Like so, so basically, like this is the function that I'm interested in producing. Okay, so let's say this is uh, m-dimensional. Okay, so instead of producing this m-dimensional vector, I will I will generate two root m-dimensional vectors. 
and do an outer product and vectorize that, uh, the, the result. Right? Now, this gives me an m-dimensional output, uh, but with two root m parameters instead of m square parameter. So, so this outer product trick like, like reduces the number of parameters uh, like significantly. And uh, my experiments we also show that it doesn't hurt the performance. Actually, like we don't see, we see this to be slightly better than uh, this, but like, like no strong comparisons. Okay, so before like demonstrating like how good is this architecture, like so I would also like to briefly touch upon uh, the other solutions in the literature. Okay, so the first solution that I have already mentioned is LSTM, which has this issue of saturating gates. Right. Okay? So then we also have uh, like various initialization techniques to initialize the forget gate of the LSTM so that this forgetting or uh, like forgetting of the previous information uh, doesn't happen often, right? Like, so the, the standard initialization that people use is initialize the forget gate by gate bias to one, right? Like so, which helps in like picking up these dependencies, right? Like and uh, the most recently introduced uh, initialization technique is this idea of chrono initialization, um, which is basically the idea that like you first consider like first first you find like which is the maximum length of dependency that you want, uh, then you uniformly sample from log of Zero to t or zero to root t. So, so basically, like, so, so there is an initialization. This is an initialization method for your forget gate based on like, like whatever length you want to remember, right? Like, so, so, so they have derived this update equation in such a way that, like, if you use the formula, then like, so you will not forget uh, things that happen three times back, right? Like, so you will preserve like 99 percentage of what information was there three times back. This is a very strong competitor, and one issue with both these initialization technique is the fact that they are just initialization techniques. So they are not constraining, so basically they are not constraining your architecture to behave in such a way. So since these are initialization to the biases, the network can choose to unlearn these initialization. So, so, so that's the issue with uh, these of kind of Then we have GRU, right, which, is, which has lesser gates than LSTMs, still they are saturating gates, right? Like, so then very recently, like, uh, like there's also this uh, new model called Janet, which is basically a forget gate only version of LSTM. So the fact that GRU is on par with LSTM are slightly better, and Janet is much better than these two architectures, it sort of gives us some empirical evidence that removing the non-saturating gates gives us some benefit. So, so, so these are the existing solutions, and like, there are also some other solutions. Like for example, uh, so like, from the non-saturating aspect, right? So we have ReLU RNNs, which we know are very difficult to train because of the exploding gradient issues, right? And people have proposed to do identity initialization or orthogonal initialization of these ReLU RNNs. Uh, but again, these are just initialization techniques, and training such architectures are really difficult in the sense like uh, they have a lot of uh, optimization issues, so unstable training. And there's also this separate line of work on parameterizing recurrent matrices to be orthogonal or unitary. Right? Like so, 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 so these kind of architectures explicitly preserve the gradient now. Uh, but the main issue with these architectures is like they have no forgetting ability. So these architectures cannot forget information. So if you want these architectures to forget information, uh, then you should add some saturating gates to it. So, so for example, like this, this is the work from our lab and like some other work, which which basically adds these forget gates to uh, like orthogonal parameterization or unitary parameterization RNNs, uh, so that like there is some forgetting ability. So, so, so we do compare with all these solutions uh, in the experiments. So, how does your RNN pretend? Uh, the, so it doesn't have the gates, right? So you 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 just have you perform like a low rank low rank update. On so, so when you have strict ReLU, uh, basically when, when when the when the erasing gates are strictly negative, it's not explicitly forgetting, but like it is it is learning to remove something, uh, which is similar to forgetting. So, how do you compare this to say I take LSTM and I just close all forget gates? I make it not forget anything. It seems to me that I would get something pretty similar to. No. Why? Uh, <laughs> uh, no, oh, so no, because like, so I will show that like, so NRU has forgetting ability. So, so like when you have strict positive value, basically when you have strict positive values for adding and erasing, uh, like, so like I'll show you that like NRU has forget. For example, like one experiment is like, when you don't reset the memory after every episode, uh, the network actually learns to reset. Yeah. Just one point actually about the parameterizing. It doesn't work like Eugene did. He doesn't actually 
in force, orthogonality is a hard constraint, it's a soft constraint, or just going to relax a bit more? Yes, yes, but uh, I guess there are ours. Okay, so. Okay, so I, I'm just citing Eugene here, but like there are also other work. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But okay. there are also other work like which explicitly parameterize it. Yeah, yeah. And, and the conclusion from the study is that if you don't relax, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, there's like a sweet spot where make it kind of orthogonal, but not so orthogonal. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that is true. So, yeah, so, so, so this, this, is, this is another direction and I guess also the last few. Right? So, so there are, there's this new kind of architecture called statistical recurrent unit, which is basically, which claims to be a non gated recurrent unit, which means that there should not be any saturation, any vanishing gradients, right? Like so, but it uses exponential moving averages for some of these statistics, like, which may, in the gradients. Again, this is a direct compact competitor to our model. Like I'm pick up so so whatever models that I list, like I, I will show a comparison with all these all these models like extensive way. And finally, like we also have uh, discrete addressing based memory augmented neural networks where the goal is explicitly to learn more long-term dependencies by like, making the addressing discrete, right? Like so that like you can pass gradients for a long enough time. Uh, but both are from like our lab, like Shalar and myself, and like so, but here like we use Reinforce our numbers of max tricks, like, which are either difficult to train or to scale. So, so in that sense, like so, like what we are proposing currently is much simpler than these are. Here. And finally, we have data flow normalization, like layer norm or recurrent batch norm, like so, which helps in some tasks, uh, but uh, but not a universal solution. So yeah, so so these are like different. Yeah. Do you also compare to Hinton's bus rates? Because I I feel that you have a bigger memory and other drawdown chick that's quite similar to that. Uh, we don't compare with fast ways. Uh, fast ways are just in the short term. Yeah. But you can also make it always add it to the, to always do the other for that. No, but that's what's converged to the zero here. Yeah. Yeah. So fast way is just an efficient way of remembering what happened like in the immediate yeah. uh, time steps. <coughs> Attention to the state. Dimensional. Yeah. Okay. So, yes, yeah, so I have I have actually listed. So you you haven't listed things that that use limit that use memory. Like extension of, of the memory. Yes. Yeah. 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 So yeah. So there, there is. Okay, there are like lots and lots of other uh, work which I haven't listed, but I'm mostly listing stuff that I've compared with. Uh, but plus, SAB was also around the same time as this. We both submitted to OpenEPS. So. Okay, so okay, so so these are the other solutions in the literature. Um, so before showing you the results, like so here is a summary of like uh, the experiments. Okay, so if you care about. So basically, like. So this is basically the number of tasks in which the models achieve top one performance or top two performance uh, for maximum of seven tasks that we consider. Like, and, and we do compare NRE with like nine other different state of the art architectures. So, so one thing that uh, like that is evident from this summary table is that NRE is the only model like which is in top one or top two uh, across all the tasks that we. So, so one of our goal was to show the generality of uh, the model, like rather than achieving state of the art in any of the tasks by themselves. Uh, so, but another thing that we notice is like, so like these architectures like which come in top one in one of the tasks, they come in top six or top seven in other tasks. So, so there's a huge variance in the performance for the like, other tasks. Okay, so, but this table was mainly to tell the paper to the reviewers. So like, let's get into the experiments, right? So the first- And, and how do you convince this, us scientifically that this means something? I'm coming to that. So, if you say it's to sell the paper for the reviewer, oh. but no, the, 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 okay, I'm saying I'm saying that because like usually when reviewers say that you are not state of the art in all the tasks that you considered. Like for example, this happened with if we submitted this to NIPS, it got rejected, and the reviewer's complaint was, uh, oh, you are not state of like you are not reaching the best performance in all the seven tasks. So, but when you when you consider seven tasks and ten architectures, no one can achieve state of the art in all the ten like in seven tasks by competing with ten architectures, like unless you have like a like completely hundred percentage perfect model, right? like so, so. That is something that reviewers miss all the time. So, so we added this for the second submission, and it actually helped us a lot. Didn't that column add up to seven? Uh, no, <laughs> <laughs> top two or top one or top one. Two. Two. <laughs> top one should add up to seven. Oh, oh, that's because like 
two architectures solve the task. It's, it's like solving the task or not, right? So two architectures solve the task. There are ties? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so the first task uh, is a uh, copying memory task, which is basically the classical uh, long term dependency benchmark, which was introduced in uh, the LSTM paper. So, so basically, you have n different symbols. And in the first k time steps, the network sees like uh, an initial sequence of k randomly sampled symbols from these n different symbols, okay, with replacement. Okay. So then the network receives a blank symbol for a long period of time. Let's say 100 steps, 200 steps. You vary this, and the difficulty is going to vary. Right? So once this is for, like once this 100 time steps is done, and you show a recall marker, then the network should learn to predict the initial sequence after the marker. This is this is a synthetic task, but this is like a to the point task in the sense like the only way in which the model can solve this task is by learning the dependency from the last time step to the first time step. Like so, so basically there is this very explicit dependency that, I, and the only way in which the model can Learn to do this task is by learning this dependency. So, if a model solves this task, then you can say that, like, if, for example, the time lag is 100 time steps and a model solves this task, then you can say that that model can model long term dependencies of the 100, right? Like, so, so, this is such a uh, like to the point uh, experiment. And we have tried this with different time lags. Like, we have even tried with, uh, we have tried with 100 paper reports, 100 and 200 time steps, but we have results for 500 and 2000. Uh, but we don't have either five or thousand two thousand results for all the architectures, only the top three architectures. So that's why I show you uh, the two hundred results. So here you can actually see that um, okay, this is too much to um, read. So 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 what I would like to highlight is this is uh, NRU, okay, and the solution this, the, the the top performer is EURN, which is basically an architecture hand engineered for this task. So so this task, which is basically like Having a fixed time lag of 200 time steps uh, requires a clockwork mechanism so that, like, you store the first few things and do the clockwork. Like, so once you reach that point, we emit these things, right? Like, so, 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 so the EURN has this explicit clockwork mechanism and you can actually solve this task in like 100 time steps or 200 time steps. So, so this is an architecture which is explicitly tailored for this task. On the other hand, like, these are much more general architecture. Well, if you vary the D time, I'll, that's the next thing that I will show. When you vary the D, D time, like, you will see the EURN, like, is miserably. Okay, so now the second one is NRU, and the next best is Janet, followed by LSTM Chrono. For most of the experiments that I will show, Janet and LSTM Chrono are the competitors. Like so, so, so they do uh, better in general. Uh, but you can see that the rate of convergence is much faster for uh, NRU as compared to the other architecture. So is now here, test, test, try to test. Oh, this is all online learning, so like there's no train test. Examples one at a time, and uh, there's no repetition of example. How do you compare the sizes of these networks where the architecture? Okay, so clear? good question. I, I missed it. So, so for all the experiments that I will show, uh, I have like okay, especially with arguments, like there are different ways to compare architecture. So, one way is to make sure that they have enough number of same number of parameters, the second way is to make sure that they have the same number of hidden states, and the third way is to make sure that they have the same number of hidden units. As in, Hidden weights, right? Like so, so we go with the first approach. Basically, make sure that all the all the architectures have the same number of parameters. There is no clear winner among these three solutions. Uh, plus, it's computationally very expensive to do all these three approaches. So we just went with that. Okay. So here is the memory visualization, and this is basically the visualization of change in the memory. So you can see that initial. Okay. So maybe this is not as clear. What is what? <laughs> uh, okay. So this is the memory cells. So x-axis is the memory cells, y-axis is the time step. So you can see that in the initial first 10 time steps, the memory is updated. And once the 10 time steps are done, the memory update is stopped, right? And only when the model sees a recall um, symbol, like it starts updating the memory. So unlike NTM, like where you don't need to update the memory while generating, here I have to update the memory because there is no uh, location-based addressing, right? Like it's all content-based addressing. So, so to, to remember that what I have generated, I have to update the memory. So, so the network by itself learns this kind of scheme. Okay. So now, this the, the, the second one is like Joshua's question, which is basically what happens when you have varying time lags, right? Like, so when you have varying time lags, here we can see that NRU is not affected much. Uh, but if you want to look at where EU RNN is, so EU RNN is here. So this is basically, so this, I think 0 0.9 is basically the performance of a random baseline. 
which basically randomly predicts the sequence instead of looking at the current, uh, like looking at the sequence, right? So, so that's the random baseline. And you can see that uh, NRU is the best, followed by what, Janet, being followed by LSTM, or in this case, Goru, I guess, yeah, in this case, Goru. So, so LSTM, Janet is the second best, but but still, NRU converges much faster than all other. Again, we have the same experiment for different time lags. Okay, so here's, yeah. So, just another outsider question here. So, how? How do you control for the, you know, the hyperparameter tweaking and stuff? Like, how do you know that these differences are real difference versus uh, you have not okay. chosen the parameters for the training method? Of the okay, so that's, that's, okay, that's, that's a good question. And that's a serious question to worry about, like, if you're just doing one task. So one way in which I am relying on these results is because, like, we have done seven tasks with variation 10 different tasks. Right? Like, and if you consider time lags, different time lags as different tasks, then we have done almost 15 tasks. So basically, like, so so one thing, so the observation here is like without doing much hyperparameter tuning, uh, like we get good results in all the tasks, like, which is which is a good indicator that like so this model is robust hyperparameter. But yes, if you do hyper proper hyperparameter tuning, these results might change. Uh, but you're spending the same budget for a parameter search for all yes. of Yes. In fact, like I spent less budget for NRE. Like, so, so like for NRE, we did not really do any hyperparameter. So, so okay. If the only thing that we wanted to match like uh, is like the number of parameters. Other than that, like so we did not do a lot of hyperparameter tuning. And but for most of the architectures, like the hyper, there, are, there are not many hyperparameters. So, so this is relatively easy comparison. Yeah. Can you comment on like the huge peaks you have on the present Okay, so we see those huge, like, like huge spikes, uh, mostly for these kind of online tasks, like where, like, you have one task, one, one, uh, one example coming at a time, like, and it's not repeated, right? So when I'm showing you some batch tasks, like, tasks with batch training, you don't see such spikes there. So, so these spikes come because of the explode ingredient issue uh, that NRU would face, simply because there's no batch ingredient right now. Now there's only explode ingredient. So, so we have, we need better ways of controlling that. Like, I'll come to that in the end. Okay, so, so this is basically the convergence plot uh, for all the top three models, like NRU, Jack, and NST and Chrono, for four different variations. They copy 100, 200, variable 100, variable copy 100, and 200. So, so you can see that, so this is basically the number of steps that the network takes to approximately receive, like, like approximately solve the task. Right? So, so you can see that uh, NRU is uh, converging much faster than Janet and NST and Chrono, which are like these data large. And because this is online learning, this is also sample complexity, the number of training samples yes. you see. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So then, like, so so this is about the long-term dependency part. So then, there's also this classical benchmark for forgetting ability, which is the idea of denoising. So 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 basically, the, this is very similar to copying memory tags. However, the data points are randomly located in a noisy sequence. So now you have to learn to filter this noisy sequence and just remember the actual data points and generate those data points. Right. So so this tests both the memorization and the forgetting ability of RNN. So, so here are the results. So, so one thing that we observed for this task, especially, is uh, so all the models like almost take 125k to 150,000 to solve this task, uh, except for EURN, like which cannot solve this task, right? Like so, so basically, like more or less, like all these uh, gated architectures would solve this task simply because they have gates and they can learn to print So then, like some slightly more realistic task. Uh, which is character level language modeling with PDB. Uh, so the numbers here might look bad because like we did not do dropout, we did not we did not do any standard tricks that people do for language modeling. We just wanted to compile the performance of different architects. So, so in that sense, like so GRU was a winner, uh, followed by NRU, uh, both in terms of uh, DPC and accuracy. So then finally, so, uh, so we also have uh, this permuted sequential in this task like where uh, the, so this is basically a I don't know. I don't know if this is a good task or a bad task, but people use this for uh, mod like uh, testing long-term dependencies. So, so more than long-term dependencies for me, like this is more about testing complex dependencies. So when you permute the sequence, right? Like so, and feed the pixels one at a time. So you are creating these complicated dependencies uh, in the sequence, and the, the task is to see if the model can pick up these complicated dependencies. Okay. So, so again, like, this is a batch setting. Like you go through the examples again and again. Here you see that there's no spike in the performance, right? Like so, so we did not see any such issues here. And uh, again, like here, NRU is the winner, followed by followed by who? Yeah. EURN. Followed by EURN. 
So, okay, this is probably the second place where eORNN is uh, winning, uh, simply because of the fact that eORNN has very less number of parameters. We would we, we were not able to match the number of parameters in eORNN with other architectures. So to increase the number of parameters in eORNN, we have to make the hidden size to be thousand. So this is basically only 700 and 724, 28 plus 28 uh, pixels, right? So in theory, eORNN can hold all the pixels in the hidden state. Then it, this is basically the performance of the linear or nonlinear classifier that's sitting on the top of the hidden state, right? Like so, so in that sense, the like eORNN has some advantage in this task. Okay. So summary. Is like out of 10 architectures, NRU is the only architecture to be talked to across all the seven tasks that we consider. Yeah. For all the experiments you presented, like what are the conclusions? Um, again, like very similar answer to what I gave you a moment Yes, we did rerun some of the experiments, but we did not rerun all the experiments with different standard analyses because I'm here, I'm relying on the fact that there are 10 tasks and I'm taking the performance in 10 tasks as the statistical. Conference than like having one task with multiple friends. Okay, so isn't it a valid answer? Sure, right. confidence intervals too. <laughs> <laughs> I think Gauthier is the representative from France here. Uh, yes. his back is pushing for confidence interval everywhere. Oh, yeah. but, but we do have one of the reviewers asked it. So we do have. Uh -huh. <laughs> so we do, so we do have that result for only one task simply because we could not run all these ten activities multiple times. Like we did it only for one of the coffee tasks, and I have, I don't have that in the slides, but we do have that result. They were small. Oh uh, yeah, they were not like the results were not varying. Okay, summary: the like, out of ten architectures, then is the only architecture to be in the top two across all the seven tasks that we considered. And um, as I, I as many people pointed out, rightly, exploding engineering is a serious issue. Yeah, right. So, so the only two solutions that we found in the literature are like living by trading by value or not. Uh, but at least in the initial stages of this project, like so, so we had very much like we had a lot of difficulty in making sure that like we don't have this exploding guarantee. So, so, so one serious question why, here. Why is trading not trading? Um, I don't know. Even with clipping, I get nans sometimes. The clipping is not completely solving the problem. So, and I spent. Weeks trying to compare clipping by value and clipping by norm, like trying to print everything in debugging and see like when is the thing changing. So, but but like I still don't. The the gradient explodes so fast that you don't have time to clip. You're already there. Yes, but that happened. Okay, so all these observations holds only in the online training setting. In full batch training, I don't have issues with using clipping by value or norm. But in online learning setting, like what happens is. There is this one really bad example which takes your network far away, and sometimes, actually, most of the times it comes back. As uh, so you can see, like there are these huge spikes, but it comes back very quickly. But sometimes, like what happens is that it just goes away. And you just clipping I'm doing that. How could it? spikes because. Uh, oh, I, I remember this. Like we had this discussion before. So, so like I tried this trick of not doing an update when the gradient is too large, but that completely destabilized the training. I don't know why, but like it destabilized the training. I don't know why. Maybe the maybe it's not just one step. Maybe it's like slowly moving towards uh, this bad region. Have you tried rigorized standard online learning method? Like, are you sure you're doing the online training correctly with your clipping? Yeah, so like what 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 other thing other things? I don't know. Like you're using Atom and this kind of crazy stuff here, or you're using Oh yes, I'm using Atom. Yeah. Maybe that's oh no no. We tried SGD. When when we had this issue, we moved to SGD, we had the same issues. No, but I'm 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 just saying that like if it works in batch but it doesn't work in online, it might also be just because you don't have the proper training procedure for Maybe true, maybe true. So but I still don't I spent like three or four weeks on this problem, and like I did not go back to it. But like this is one of the issues that needs to be. Uh, so the next thing is like trying several NLP problems where LSTM is a de facto recurrent neural network. Like so, so the paper basically says that like when you have really long term dependencies, we do better. But when you have short term dependencies, like at least from the initial experiments, I see that we are matching the performance of the LSTM, but not better than LSTM. Probably we don't need to be better than LSTM. So so one of the like strong empirical uh, experiment uh, that we have to do is like to try different state of the art uh, 
task by then let's give us a state of that and see if we can match the performance of it. So, so then we can claim that we have an application which is like doing greater than or equal to uh LSJ. So also like modeling long term predictive assignment issues in reinforcement learning using this architecture was the initial motivation for this project. And that's something that we are currently trying to do. Okay, so I think I spent more time on the first part. Yeah, yeah. Before we move on the next part, there is one last question. Can you go back when you uh, present like the V vector that you have like, in your formulation? Like, uh, this so like you mentioned somewhere that you perform some normalization on them. Oh yeah. Okay, so, I, I understand your question. So the normalization might shrink the gradients. Exactly. Uh, like you yeah, you introduce Okay. Right. Okay. So one plot which I don't have here, like which I should have had here, is the gradient plot. So even the paper doesn't have a gradient plot simply because we have different tensor boards and we did not have time to integrate this. That, that's a bad reason. Uh, but in practice, we don't see that happening. So one reason might be the fact that like normalization in general helps, right? Like for example, batch norm or uh, layer norm, right? So normalization helps to some extent in like like in, in the optimization process. So so in practice, like we haven't seen yes gradient. Okay, so so when we say non-saturating recurrent unit, first time when the paper got rejected simply because of the name. They said like you're saying non-saturating recurrent unit. You have normalization. You have relu saturating, right? So when I say non-saturating recurrent unit. We change the title of the paper towards non saturating right? so, <laughs> so this is not completely, this is not 100 percent solving the vanishing gradient problem, but it is doing better than LSTM. So that's the thing. Okay. Yeah. So uh, actually, uh, so we have done different tasks. So there are different long term reasons taking those tasks. For example, to buy the information and the different from the yes. that are not using this initiative, one single architecture to deal with all these things. Uh, ideally, I want okay. Ideally, I want a very flexible architecture where I do not need to care about what is the dependency in my task list. But as a practical, maybe as a practitioner, maybe if you know that thousand is the maximum step, yes, you can use that prior and design architectures where like you can actually use that prior. Yeah, but but here the goal is to have a general purpose. Okay, so having spent too much time on first part, so the second part uh, is about. Uh, training recurrent neural networks for lifelong learning. So this, this is a uh, joint work with Shagan and Yashua, and this will also be presented at NeurIPS Continuing Learning Workshop. Okay, so 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 what is lifelong learning? So lifelong learning is probably one of the dreams of artificial intelligence. Right? It's also known as incremental learning, continuing learning, explanation-based learning, or never-ending learning, like whatever way in which you want to call it, or from whatever community that you're looking at this problem. Right? Like, so. So, but the general idea in lifelong learning is that you have this single agent, which is neural network for us, right? Like, so a single neural network learning a series of tasks, an infinite series of tasks, one by one. Right? So, so you might or might not see the same task again, uh, but this is a continuous learning setting like where you have to, there is no notion of training or testing. So you perform, learn, perform, learn, perform, learn. Right? Like, so, so that is lifelong learning. And why should we care about lifelong learning? So. So we should care about lifelong learning because it will be more effective at learning and retaining knowledge across different tasks, right? Like so, so which is probably one of the ways to solve the general interest, like achieve general intelligence, right? Like so, rather than having a single system, expert system, which is too good in one thing but not at all good in like different other things, right? Like so, also it would be able to obtain better priors for the task at hand by using the prior knowledge and exploiting similarity across these tasks, right? Like so, this is why we should care about lifelong learning and. The central challenge is in lifelong learning. There are two central challenges which stops us from doing this. The first challenge is the challenge of catastrophic learning. Right? So, so when you learn a series of tasks, right? And so when you are learning a new task and you haven't seen the previous task for a long time, so you'll forget how to perform that task. Right? Even humans have this catastrophic learning. Right? Like so, so, but with neural networks, it becomes even more worse because of the gradient descent. When you do gradient descent, you are seeing enough examples from only one task. When you are slowly moving your network towards that task, right? It's, which means that you are essentially unlearning like what you have learned for the previous task. So this is a serious issue, and this, this is the central issue. Like when you are especially interested in retaining the information from the past, right? It's that's the issue of capacity for it. And we also have this issue of capacity saturation, which is not that much discussed in the community. Like so, simply because we don't have good enough benchmarks to. Even deal with this issue, right? So, what is this issue? Like, so I have a parameterized network, right? Like, so, when I have a parameterized network, it has finite amount of capacity. So, if, if let's say let's say I have a network which has the capacity to learn ten tasks, 
Now, if I'm putting this network to test through 20 tasks or 30 tasks, then the only way in which the network can learn the 11th task is by unlearning some part of the previous task. Right? So, so basically, you get catastrophic forgetting also because of capacity saturation. So there are two sources of catastrophic forgetting. One is capacity saturation, and the other source is the brain desert itself, right? Like so, when you do brain update for one task, but you forget things about the other. Task. Uh, but with uh, with capacity saturation, like so, there are of course there are many solutions. Like for example, like why not start with a much bigger network, right? But that's never a good solution. Yet. But even if you have a bigger network. Without good homogenization. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, yes, I'm coming to that. So, so basically, like, so, so my point is similar, like in the sense, like even if you start with a very bigger network, right? So, so first of all, like you don't know the upper bound, right? Like so, like you start with a 2,000 unit network, like which can hold 10 tasks. What if I give you 20 tasks? Then the network fails at some point, right? So basically, you don't know how many parameters you need, uh, in like with beforehand in a such a setting, right? Like, even if you know that, as Yosha pointed out, like even if you know that, then you may not have better generalization simply because you have enough capacity to remember everything. So, so these are like the two serious issues uh, that needs to be resolved in that problem. Um, so based on these issues, so, so we list out the bunch of characteristics that an ideal lifelong learning system should have. Uh, this is not a new list, like people are trying to come up with this list for like last 20 years or 30 years, uh, but we are just trying to be more rigorous based on our data. And also to set the notations for the project. Okay, so the first ideal characteristics is like a lifelong learning should, system should have knowledge retention. In the sense, if it learns some new information from previous tasks, it should be able to retain that uh, and not forget that. Right. And so this is with respect to the catastrophic forget. Then the second desirable characteristic is like it should be able to do knowledge transfer. So when I say knowledge transfer, it means that like whatever it learned from the previous tasks should be able to reuse those information. And learn the next task much faster, right? So this is also related to meta learning. And the third important characteristic is the parameter efficiency. So I don't want the parameters of the network to grow linearly, even linearly with respect to the number of tasks. There are architectures which grow quadratically, but I don't want the parameters to grow even linearly. I want an architecture where the parameters grow sublinearly with respect to the number of tasks, right? So that's the third uh, characteristic. And the final characteristic is the ability to do model expansion. I need an architecture. I need a general purpose architecture which can expand its capacity as and when needed, right? Like so, but again, there are some concerns with model expansion. So, for example, we have ideas like policy distillation, distillation in general, like so, where you take a network and distill with a larger network, right? Like so, but distillation requires a lot of time. Uh, but in a true lifelong learning setting, I want a zero shot distillation or a zero shot expansion of uh, the memory, right? Or, or, or the architecture. So, so these are like the four ideal uh, characteristics that any like from learning should have. Okay. So now, like before showing you uh, like the architecture uh, that we are using, like so, so I'll also list briefly the other existing solutions for both these central challenges. The first, the first challenge is catastrophic forgetting. Right? So the standard there are a bunch of standard solutions in the literature. The first solution is to freeze the parts of the model as it trains on successive tasks. So, for example, elastic weight consolidation does that. So, it, it essentially regularizes the parameter updates in such a way that parameters which are useful for the previous tasks are updated less when compared to parameters which are not that useful for the previous tasks. Right? Okay. So, so the issue with this approach is you are basically not ex you're not using the entire capacity of the network. Right? So, you are slowly like decreasing the capacity of the network, which means at some point you will like you will run out of capacity. And the second uh, solution is to periodically reverse with examples from the previous task. Like for example, I call does that, right? So uh, the limitation with this is like you need extra time to go uh, rehearse with previous examples, uh, which is which is okay in some uh, setups, but like if you are a pure online learning setup where you have to perform it every time, so it's probably not a good solution. And finally, there is this uh, another idea, which is to constrain the optimization to make sure that the loss on the previous task do not decrease. I do not increase, right? Like so, so gradient episodic memory from DeepMind is doing that. So basically, like you you constrain your gradient updates in such a way that you don't make an update which is going to affect the previous time, right? Like so, these are like three. That requires keeping the old. Some things. yeah, that requires keeping some of the examples. So that's the limitation. So so all so all these solutions are like are not complete solutions. Like they have some advantages, some disadvantages. Uh, now let's also look at the capacity saturation and model expansion part. 
So we have this standard knowledge distillation idea, right? Like so you can either distill from a smaller network to a larger network or from a larger network to a smaller network, right? Like so, but as I mentioned before, distillation is not that good in the setting simply because it requires all the examples. It has to go through like a, 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 like a considerable period of distillation time, right? Like so, uh, on the other hand, I don't understand how does it solve the uh, no, this is for capacity expansion. Like, like, let's say you want to expand the model. Okay, so you, you train the larger number. Yeah, yeah. Then you take the small one. And yeah. Then... yeah. So the other solution uh, in the literature is to come up with these function preserving transformation to expand a small train network to a large untrained network. So, so this is the idea of net to net, uh, where you basically take a train network and do a zero shot expansion of that network to uh, an untrained network. Okay, so in this case, there's no delay in expansion. Uh, but there are also other solutions like one network per task. This is really a poor solution. Examples are progressive networks and network algorithms. Right? Like so, so basically, these, these papers will show results with two or three tasks. But if you want to do it for 100 tasks, then you need like 100 networks per task. Like, like basically, 100 networks for the whole thing. right? Because one network per task is not the solution. So, so these are like different ways of solving model expansion. OK, so, so this table. Um, I, I, I haven't talked about some of the other solutions, but you can read that in the paper. In the paper. Uh, but this table basically character, like, takes all these state of the art models and characterizes like so, like like which of the desirable characteristics that they satisfy. Right. So, so now we are looking for one model which will satisfy all these four. Like so, so as you can see, you want model expansion for sure, which means that these are the only three models possible. Out of which these two are four solutions. So we just choose net to net. So net to net has model expansion capabilities. Now the next question is like, what model can we combine net to net with so that like you get uh, all the four characters? Right? Because there are two options, gem or IMM. Uh, in my opinion, both are not satisfactory solutions. Uh, but gem is like evaluated in much more tasks than IMM, incremental moment matching, and uh, also shown to be like uh, like a good scalable solution. Not scalable in terms of computation because, like, you have to go through these examples again and again. But, but scalable to larger tasks. So, so essentially, like, what we do in this work, uh, which is more of an exploratory work, is to combine net to net with gradient episodic memory. So, both gradient episodic memory and net to net uh, were originally proposed uh, for a feed-forward setting. And net to net, even though the inspiration was continued learning, they just do one task uh, evaluation. They, they basically have one task. And the training saturates like they just expand the network and repeat the same task again. So that is not an online learning setting in the sense that like you see the same examples even after expansion, right? Like so, so, so one of the contributions here, like so, which is not so interesting or exciting, is to test that these two are like solutions which are proposed only for feed forward architectures uh, work even in a recurrent setting. So, so that that with little bit of modifications, yes, they work properly in recurrent settings. Uh, but the main contribution here is to come up with this uh, single model which has all these desirable characteristics and evaluate uh, the benefit of such models. Okay, so even before showing you the combined model, right? So the, like, I would like to spend one or two minutes on the need for benchmark. So basically, like there is this absence of standardized training and evaluation benchmarks for lifelong learning, which is kind of hindering the progress in like so. So even though people are talking about lifelong learning for like 30 or 40 years, right? Like, so, so we are able to come up with Simple systems like what I propose here, simply because of the progress in uh, the, the current neural network technology. Right? Like so, so we have good enough single task systems that like we started worrying, like we are now starting to worry about like, these kind of continuous learning sessions. Right? Like so, even then, we don't have standard benchmarks here, which means that people come up with their own benchmarks, which are toyish. Yes, we also have a toyish benchmark, uh, but that's the problem. So, so people come up with toyish benchmarks, and everyone has their own benchmark. Uh, then it becomes difficult to compare with others, right? So there is no standard benchmark for uh, testing such architectures, and also there is no standard benchmark which explicitly attacks one of these problems, like adaptive targeting or capacity expansion. For example, surprisingly, there is no paper which talks about capacity expansion in lifelong learning setting. So even though that's the inspiration for many of the standard uh, solutions in the literature. Okay, uh, but for supervised learning, we have these simple tasks like 450 MNIST based. Uh, a data set or C400 based data set for, uh, for lifelong learning. And they are all like very simple in the sense you take the MNIST data set and consider two, three random classes 
construct a data set. Then three other random classes construct a data set, and so on. You construct like 50 data sets like that. Right? So these are simple uh, solutions, like simple data sets. And for reinforcement learning, there is no standard benchmarks, and also people mostly use very few games. Like most of the 30 day learning papers in reinforcement learning use at max five games, not more than that. So, so with five games, like do you really need a continuous learning setup? Like are you going to saturate uh, the capacity? Uh, I'm not sure. Right. Like, so, so basically, the other need is like there's no benchmark available for lifelong learning in the context of sequential supervised learning, which is what we are pitching at. And I will also explain why we should do sequential problems in lifelong learning. Right. Like, so, one reason is sequential supervised learning is more close to the R setting. So, I meant reinforcement learning setting, but Shagun meant real life setting. So, you can take it in either way. So, so this is. This is more, this is basically much better than like having MNIST or C400 results. That's what I'm claiming. And the, the, the main advantage that when we move to sequential setting from non-sequential setting is that it is easy to ensure that the network is saturated quickly by just increasing the sequence length. So, so this actually helps us to study this problem of capacity expansion. Can you give an example of sequential um, like even the copy tab, any sequential problem, right? Like so, so if you if you Basically, like instead of considering feed, like simple one-step solutions, like we are looking at multi-step solutions, so that uh, so that like as I increase the number of things, that we usually do it on. Yes, yes. So 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 one of the things that the paper is pitching is to consider lifelong learning with R and setup, simply because like you have these additional nice things that you don't see in feed power set. Where is the change? In uh, between sequences. Okay. Also. It is easy to define a series of tasks based on sequence length as curriculum. So, so basically, like I can keep on increasing the difficulty by just increasing the curriculum, like increasing the sequence. So, so when I initially come up with this, like so, like like at least like Shagun was not satisfactory. Like, like he thought like it's a very simple curriculum, uh, but surprisingly, so so we have this result for like LSTM, like training an LSTM on a sequential task, which is here sequential stroke MS. I will explain what the task. In a couple of slides, uh, that doesn't matter. But what matters here is here is a sequential task where I'm training an LSTM with sequence length as the curriculum. Yeah. And going back to your previous talk, with varying the interval length mm -hmm. that you need to mem memorize, also be an example of different tasks. Yes. 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 So yeah. So that could be one of the study. So but but in this case, like, so the interesting observation here is like I'm just training on on any. This works for any sequential task. I'm training on a sequential task. I'm training with sequence length. So the tasks here is basically the length of the sequence. It could be one, two, three, four, five, or I think it's multiples of three. Like so it, it's it's some multiples of the sequence length. Okay. So now you can see that I train with just sequence length, when I say one. Okay. Then I test it with other sequence lengths. Obviously, the performance will be bad. Okay. Now I train the network with just sequence length two. So we say that we basically clear the level whenever like the performance is more than 90 percentage. So when it achieves more than 90 percentage. You look at the backward transfer for sequence length one. It has learned only sequence length one followed by sequence length two. Now it is overfitting to sequence length two in the sense like so the performance for sequence one drops significantly. But let's not worry about the forward transfer because forward transfer is always going to be bad, right? Like so, but as you as you see here, like as you as you just train based on sequence length as the curriculum, uh, that itself is challenging for current recommended <laughs> simply because uh, like it overfits to that sequence. Solution is still not algorithmic. More, it's, it's less algorithmic than that we expect. So in that sense, uh, this is kind of convincing curriculum uh, to use. Okay, so now we also propose a bunch of simple tasks uh, where you have control over the task and also use that as a benchmark. Right? The first task is copying task, which is basically an algorithmic task which is whether the networks can learn to store and recall a long sequence of random vectors, which was introduced in the NTM paper. So basically, given a sequence of random vectors followed by a flag. I want to reproduce these random sequence. Okay, so now the difficulty levels here are the length of the sequence, and the metric that we're going to use is bitwise accuracy. So we'll start with length three, six, nine, twelve, and so on. So basically, like, like, okay, so we'll start the training with length three. When the network achieves ninety percent accuracy, we move to length six. If it achieves ninety percent accuracy, we move to length nine, right? And so whenever it fails to clear the uh, accuracy level within, let's say, twenty thousand time steps, we stop the training. So basically, the network has failed. Uh, to clear that level, right? So that's the setup. And the second task is associative recall, which is another algorithmic task where after showing a sequence of items, the network has I'm going to show the network a random item. 
then the, now the network has to say what was the next item after this random item. Okay. And here items are usually another sequence of random vectors. So basically, you have random vector block, random vector block, random vector block. You show one of them, the network has to predict the next one. That is the task. Uh, here again, the levels are length of the sequence, and the metric is because. So we have an even more challenging task is uh, what we call as sequential stroke endless. So which is basically the benchmark for long, which is proposed as a benchmark for long-term dependencies in one of our earlier papers. So basically, here each endless image is going to be represented as a sequence of strokes. So instead of pixels, like the pixel pixel endless, like so here it's going to be a sequence of strokes. Uh, it might look like a simpler problem, but we make the problem much more challenging by giving sequence of 10 stroke sequences. So basically, like I take 10 digits, I have the sequence stroke information for all the 10 digits. I'm going to feed them uh, continuously to the system. And the output is the corresponding sequence of digits in the same order. So this is a much more challenging task than the previous two tasks, and also much more realistic because this involves some learning. It is not just copying, right? It involves some learning, and the network has to learn to chunk the sequence first. Then it should learn to Recognize the sequence, uh, recognize the chunk, then it should learn to remember the digits in the same order, right? So this involves much more uh, from the, like, it expects much more from the network than the previous one. Here again, the levels are number of digits and the metric is per digit accuracy. Okay, so the setup, as I said, is like, so we are going to consider each task as a domain and each difficulty level as a task. Just, we're just switching the location. Uh, and we're going to do online learning, no separate validation test set. And whenever the current task accuracy is greater than, let's say, 90 percentage, then the level is clear. Then the network is move, the network can move to the next level, right? Like so now, however, the network still sees all the examples in one level before moving to the next level, simply to make sure that different networks have the same number of updates. Just to make, just to be fair with all the architectures, like we show the same number of examples, even though they clear the network, clear the level. And we will report the current task accuracy, which is basically how good is the network in this task. Previous task accuracy, which is a summary of all the backward transfer, and future task accuracy, which is the summary of all the future transfer. Right. Like so, so one nice thing about the sequential uh, like curriculum-based uh, training is it's the same task but with different difficulty levels. So I can actually compute the forward transfer, um, unlike like when the setting where you have different tasks. Right. Like so, so the, that's a hack, but yeah, it's useful for us. Okay. And uh, if a level is not clear, then the training is stopped. However, like when you compare, consider models with expansion capabilities, then we will allow the network to train after one step of expansion. If the model fails, expand, then continue training. Right? So that's the setup. And as I mentioned, like we're going to combine gradient episodic memory with a net return. So what is gradient episodic memory? Like it helps to alleviate catastrophic forgetting. And when training on a level, the parameter gradient is projected to make sure that the gradient update does not decrease the loss on the previous tasks. So to do this, like you basically Okay, so one downside is it reduces the effect of the effective capacity of the model, as is the case with any catastrophic, any catastrophic operating solutions. And the other issue is like we need to store training examples from the previous task, right? Like so, so in practice, what we do is like we randomly pick like 10 examples and just use those 10 examples as a representative for the previous task. And surprisingly, that works very well. Okay, so the second solution is net to net, which is basically a zero shot knowledge transfer from a small trained teacher to a large untrained student. By using function preserving transformation. This is a very, very neat technique in the sense. So, what they essentially do is they take this trained teacher network, okay, and convert it into an untrained student network. Okay, so you take these parameters phi and expand, expand it into theta. So, how do we do that? So basically, there's a random ma mapping from the size of the teacher network to the size of the student network. Let's say you have 100 units and you want to expand it to 150 units. So what we're going to do is we are first going to copy. Uh, the 100 units as such, okay, then you are going to randomly replicate 50 of these 100 units. So that's it. So now to make sure that the output is same, you have to divide by two for these units, right? Like, so I'm not going to explain the math, but that's what they are doing. So basically, like you divide the output by two for such that you know, those units so that like the output is still the same, but you have a, you have essentially taken the vector and divided it into two, right? Like, so then the output is preserved, right? So that that's the solution. And the combined model is basically very, very simple. Like you train the rest of gem updates, and whenever the model fails to clear a task, you expand the network using the internet and continue right? Yeah. So you could uh, train the model on NIST, then make it larger, and then also train it on, say, Latin characters. So you could try that again. Then do... no, so can you repeat the question? So, so you could uh, train it on NIST first, 
Okay. Yes, we can do that. Train it on the uh, Latin character that would still remember. Uh, hope is that it will still remember. Yes, you are going to have some catastrophic forgetting simply because like we don't have a perfect solution, right? But our claim is like this is going to remember more than any of the other objects. Okay, so now some results. So this is the current task accuracy in copy task. So, so current task accuracy is, has nothing to do with uh, the backward of position transfer. Right? It just shows like how good is it in when performing that particular task. So here for a for a upper bound, we have this green line, which is basically a larger LSTM, and uh, this blue line is actually our current LSTM, which is much smaller. And you can see that the smaller LSTM fails at this point. Okay. So then we expand the LSTM, then it actually clears more levels. On the other hand, when you do a larger LSTM with gem updates, so remember that this green line, even though it looks good, is not useful because it is going to have very bad backward transfer. Right? Okay, so we want a network which is doing good in the current task, plus have a good forward transfer, like good backward transfer, right? So, so this is such model. And we are beating that model when adding model expansion capabilities. But this, so basically, this is a smaller network. With gem updates and capacity expansion, which clears more level than a larger network with just gem, gem updates. So this also highlights the fact that when you add gem, the capacity decreases. You can see that from 13 levels it becomes 10 levels because of the capacity exhaustion that happens due to gem. Same is with same is observed for all the different tasks that we have associated recall or sequential elements. So, so then let's look at the backward transfer. Right? So, so for the backward transfer, this is our Golden uh, upper bound, right? So this is this is the best thing that we can achieve. This is a larger LSTM with gem updates, right? This is this is the upper bound, and here you have two things: the smaller LSTM with just net to net, there's no expansion, and there's a smaller LSTM, sorry, smaller LSTM net to net with no gem. This is smaller LSTM net to net plus gem, right? So this is our model, and you can see that like, this is doing better than without gem, which is obvious, and it is also doing much closer to. Uh, like the true upper bound, right? And you can see the similar results for uh, all the three tasks that we have seen. Okay, finally, the forward transfer, right? Like so, so, so here there is no upper bound or no, there's no upper bound or lower bound, right? Yeah, so here there's no clear upper bound or lower bound. Like we're just comparing the performance of large LSTM, large LSTM with gem, small LSTM gem, net net, right? Like so, so here you can see that our model has better forward transfer at some cases, at some cases, but it's uh, not. Right? Like so, but but again, like here we don't know which is the for power transfer, we don't know which is the good base line or which is the good uh, upper bow. Okay. So somebody so, so here your argument that the green line is not the best because of the forward performance. So you run three tasks and for all the three setups, you have a different golden standard. Like for example, the large listing is good for the current task and for the future task, but not for the previous task. So the same model, our model is being compared with three different models with three different setups. I don't know, the, the large ST, LSTM was doing the best in all metrics. Oh, all yeah, that is because the large LSTM is the upper bound for. No, no, go for the. Uh, okay, so the large, okay, for current task, large LSTM is the upper bound. Yeah, and the uh, backward task, you still yeah. had the. the... Yeah, we don't even have the large LSTM. Oh, there's no large LSTM here. here. That works worse than the large Oh, LSTM. that was a serious issue with our graphs. So when we initially submitted, the reviewers could not decode this in a minute simply because like, we changed the we changed the upper bounds and everything. So, so here it is just the large LSTM. So this is large LSTM plus gem, which is the upper bound. So, so the text actually explains it very well, but the graph doesn't. So our bad representation. <laughs> okay, so as a summary, like so, so so we basically provide an intuitive benchmark for sequence shape problems in lifelong learning settings. And we unify gem. Which is a lifelong learning technique to alleviate catastrophic forgetting with net to net, which is a capacity expansion technique. And we show that both gem and net to net, which are originally proposed for feed forward networks, are indeed useful for a current neural network setting. So, so when I say this, people are not impressed, but that's something that you have to show. Right? Like so, and we show that the unified model is better suited for lifelong learning as compared to the individual constitutive models. So yeah, that's, that's it. Seven more minutes, but that's it. Thank you. How do you decide when to do that? As like, how do you decide when it has more capacity? Oh, so whenever, so, so that is in the protocol, right? So whenever the whenever the network fails, you expand. Okay. And what we don't report here is like we have also expanded 
multiple times. So basically, like expand, you can expand as many times as you want. Like whenever it fails again, you expand. Oh, one thing that we spend so much time is so like net to net looks like a very simple solution and it looks like it is not the solution. Right? So, so we just spend so much time on coming up with better uh, substitute for net to net, uh, but we couldn't. So that's actually a good problem to think of. Maybe net to net is the solution, I don't know, but but for me, like it, it looks like we can do better. HMT with the main approach is also working for convolutional networks. Uh, okay, so net to net gem both has been applied for convolutional networks. So uh, in your sequential tasks, is the early task a subsequence of the later task? I mean, if, if the, the sequence in earlier tasks uh, are being included in the, in the later For some tasks, yeah, yeah, for mostly yes, yes. So basically like earlier tasks are shorter sequences and lot, like later tasks are longer sequences. Mm -hmm. So in your first part, you already had the copy task. So that's a different copy, this is a different copy. So that is okay. So that that doesn't require more memory in the sense that's just like copying sequence of numbers. Okay, this is copying sequence of random vectors. Okay, it's continuous vectors. Uh, no, that's still binary vectors, but like uh, that's just one hot. Like, this is uh, this is not one hot. That's only different. Yeah, we may need more. more you have more things to remember. Yeah. So you can use the NRE for that. Uh, oh, we can use NRE. So these two are like parallel projects. So, so yeah, so what about combining? Yeah. So yeah, one thing that we definitely want to see is like that's all these uh, observations on LSTM holds for NRE, right? It's a very simple experiment to try. Yeah, but that's just what we have to try. But I would expect seeing similar results simply because like here the goal is not these tasks are not that long-term differential tasks. So probably we'll have same results as LSTM. Yeah, another interesting thing, uh, which is also okay. Uh, another boring thing to try is like so to actually like test the same, come up with let's see to see if we can come up with similar conclusion for all the standard uh, the RNN architectures like right? LSTM, NRU, GRU. So all you see are different, right? It's also that that's something useful to know, but it's also very boring to do. That's computationally very expensive. So the gem update takes a lot of time. So another interesting research question here is like so can we Come up with better ways of catastrophic solving catastrophic coding. Right? Like, both elastic weight consolidation and gem are not satisfactory solutions. So, so that's another line in which we are currently thinking. Basically, you can improve gem, you can improve net to net, and the advantage now is like like what we claim as an advantage with our paper is like now if you come up with any of the improvements to these two things, you can just test it with like this uh, standard based benchmark. Something else that's, that's a restriction of the way that you set this up is that you have control. You're assuming you have control over asking for the next task, right? Because you you decide yes. on that there's a, that threshold, yes. and then you say, okay, give me the harder problem. Yeah. A lot of the time in the, in the real world, you can't ask. Yes, for that, that is problem, true. Right? That is so true. Just come at you. Yeah, yeah. So that might be another generalization. Uh, yes, that is true. So that is a different aspect of Python learning, right? So so you it's not that you see increasing difficulty. That was uh, like in task. Like you will see an easy task, next day difficult task, next day easy task, and so on. Uh, but then, like so, if we have to over accommodate that, like so, then the, like it's, it becomes much much more difficult to come up with the benchmark. So, so, so one thing that uh, okay, one of the thing that I care about this benchmark is like so you can explicitly solve catastrophic try to solve catastrophic forgetting and uh, expansion, but that is not going to be a general solution as I suggested. To make it a general solution, it should also work. When you have these kind of different difficulty levels in the task, uh, or continuous one, right? Because you also yeah. have the yeah. as well. Yeah, but probably that would require more effort uh, in terms of constructing the benchmark. But at least something is better than nothing. So this is a limitation of the benchmark. Like, yeah, when does the curriculum could make the benchmark easy? The model is not kind of constrained. Like, the the fact that you decide to expand is totally your choice. Like, you don't have to really yeah. wait for the special because. In fact, we have observed that if I know that I'm going to, you know, clear level, right? If I retrospectively expand a level, eight, that sometimes helps me more, helps me to clear more levels. So this thing is like independent of the benchmark, and the thing which is suggested, that's like limitation of the benchmark. Oh yeah. So another thing that we tried is like to have something like transient curves, right? Like so basically, like when you when you're expired, like like when your performance saturates, right? Like so so let's say it saturates like this. So then probably it's better to expand here than here because like when you are when you are in the saturated zone, like you have already unlearned something, right? Like so so one thing that we experimented with is like to have continuous, like ha like keep like last few uh, 
uh, snapshots of the model and choose to expand. Like when it fails here, choose to expand here instead of here. So I think that kind of helped, but there's no, we did not like, like investigate much on that. So the bath box, can you show the bath box? Yeah. Which one? The, the bath. Yeah, this, this one. So when you say the previous, uh, the previous task, you mean the average of all? Yeah, oh yeah, so this is an average of all the previous tasks. Thank you.